Alright, peace, peace. This is a continuation of the Make of the White Man. This is part four. Okay, we're going to be going into how they live in the caves. Alright? So, to get you up to speed, we have already come to the conclusion, the facts buried out, that Adam and Eve represent the white race. Throughout religious texts and history. So, now we're going to go back here to the Gorilla Snowflake, right? And it says, how did Snowflake die? This, this, uh, this gorilla. It says, Snowflake died of skin cancer in 2000, 2003. The famous, a famous albino gorilla that, that lived for 40 years at the Barcelona Zoo, God got its white coloring by way of inbreeding. Inbreeding. What, is, what does that mean? Breeding. You take this, these, you take this black gorilla, these two black gorillas, you made them together, and then if they produce this color, you keep on breeding them. Wiping this out, wiping this, wiping this color out. Okay, this is what this is. Now, so let's go. Let's get into this. Let's finish. Let's finish reading this. Now, I done read this whole book for free. The whole book, and like I said, it's only ninety some pages. So, we're chapter six, the hills and caves of West Asia. Asia. So this chapter examines the evidence surrounding what happened after the Caucasians arrived in the hills of West Asia. It talks about how they were roped in, and it takes a look at some of the probable methods used to keep them beyond the borders of civilization. Uh, concerning what happened. Concerning what took place after the whites arrived in West Asia, Muhammad writes, quote, Once there, they were roped in to keep them out of paradise. To make sure the Muslims who lived along the borders of East and West Asia were ordered to patrol the border to keep Yaakov's devils in West Asia so that the original nation of black men could live in peace and that the devils could be alone to themselves to do as they please as long as they didn't try crossing the east border. So now we're going to the walls of the caves, the walls of the caucus, okay? So it says that travel in and out of the caucus's mountains and possible, is possible only through a small number of narrow pastures. The facts show that after the whites had arrived in, in the area of the caucus mountains, an extensive series of walls and fortresses were erected, sealed off all exits coming down out of the hills. The evidence shows that massive structures of stone and wood covered with iron were placed along the narrow passage, thereby blocking any travel into or out of that part of the world. So let's go down here. It says here that uh, the facts also show that these walls had been put into place for, for the purpose of keeping the white tribes from crossing back over to civilization. High atop the towering walls, flanked by steep cliffs and insurmountable burials of rock and ice, armed guards stood watch while other patrols surrounded regions of the, of the border. Known as to quote the gates of the Caucasus or the Caucasian walls, descriptions of them appear in the works of many writers including the Roman encyclopedias, Pliny. Who is Pliny? Pliny the Elder. This dude. I'm giving you facts to look up. This is Pliny. This is a, this is a Greek. This is a Roman. Greek. Pliny the Elder. All right, this is him.
Pliny the Elder wrote the encyclopedia Natu uh, Naturalist History or Natural History, right? Pliny the Younger wrote of him in a letter to the historian Tactus. Okay? So keep these two, Pliny the Elder and Tactus, in mind. So it says it that Pliny the Elder, that dude we just looked at, he says, uh, Pliny, he says, he's not, so now he's, he's seeing this stuff. He says, Pliny, he says, once deep in the heart of the Caucasus Mountains, Pliny came face to face with some of the, with some of the remains of these ancient forages. In a report on the incident, Pliny described a gigantic iron gate, which stood, he said, blocking one of the pastures in the middle of the Caucasus Range. Writing in his book, Natural History, what we just looked at right here. Okay? What we just looked at. It says here that um, Pliny commented on the historical significance of these ancient gates and walls, stating that they had long ago been erected for the purpose of burying or barring the passage of the uh, of the innumerable tribes. H. N. Weather, the historian, also talks about how a series of fortresses have once been used as barricades in all the exits along the Caucasus Mountains. On page 270 of his book, The Mind of the Ancient World, Weather affirms, quote, the gates of the Caucasus were barred with beam shot with iron. Here was Cumania. A fortress erected to keep back the savage tribes beyond. Beyond. Okay, so we're talking about this stuff, right? And uh, we're gonna keep on going. They talking about the walls. They had they built these walls to keep these devils out. Okay. So let's keep on going. So now we're at the part. It says that, uh, let's see here. The Desert Bandits. What was the result of those who were able to sneak past the border? So some of them would sneak, was getting out, right? So like, like here, it says here that, um, it says here that one writer, a professor from Oxford University, talks about the high degree of planning that had to have gone into the into the uh, construction of the Caucasus walls. Praising the or organizational skill of its builders, the professor pointed out, quote, the fortification of these narrow defiles was the simplest, most natural, and least uh, expensive in regard to upkeep of any possible method of frontier, frontier defense in the Caucasus. Yet, despite such a well-organized defense, roving gangs of Caucasians would, from time to time, managed to slip past weak spots along the border, hanging on to the back of horses. The lucky savages would be free to pillage the way southward. William Hardy McNeil wrote about the persistence with which the white man tried to break through the guarded region and of their constant attempts to reach and plunder the civilizations of the south. You see that? So, now it's saying here, the desert bandit what was what was uh, what was the result of those who were able to sneak past the border? Over the course of many years, the roads running along the desert became infested with pockets of Caucasian bandits, hiding out along roads and caravan routes. The robbers survived by preying upon travelers, often often murdering and stripping their victims of their possessions. The records of the region are repellent. repellent with references describing how the moderates would often hide inside a hole or behind some bush near an, isolated, near an isolated stretch of road and then jump out to beat the wary traveler with sticks while robbing him of his cargo. One report from the records of ancient Egypt says, says this, quote, The ways are not guarded roads. Men sit in the bushes until the until the benign traveler comes to take away his burden and steal what is on him. 
he is presented with the blows of a stick and slain wrongfully. And slain wrongfully. Give me one second. They tell you what, what's going on here. What these white folks, are, what these white devils are doing. Let's keep on going. Other sources from Mesopotamia tell of a similar violence inflicted upon the original people by gangs of whites who had come down from out of the caves. One source in particular states, quote, in a cave in the depths of the, of the underworld, they have grown up. They are not acquainted with compassion and mercy. They cause disasters on the road, on the roads. On the roads of the land, they lie and crouch. On page 35 of the book, Myths and Legends of Babylonia and Assyria, Lewis Spence quotes a source from ancient Samaria describing how, quote, the devil of the desert would frequently lay, would frequently lay obstacles across the road and wait until an unsuspecting person stopped to remove the obstacles, at which time the nomads would sneak up from behind and strike them down. This is what the ancient writer intended when he wrote, quote, the evil undug, the evil you dug, which makes the solitary ways difficult to pass over, which goes forth in secret, covers up the ways. The robber, who cannot be forced back, they have struck down the wayfaring man in a storm. The infestation of the deserts and the resulting that uh, danger along the roads and caravan routes occurred during the period of reconstruction, which was outlined in chapter one. Now, we're gonna keep on going. Okay, so it's talking about these talking about these things, right? And now we're gonna go over here. And it says all traditions of the Caucasus Mountains. The twelve cities of the Caucasus, Assad Bay, talks about the people who used to inhabit that area. On page 128, he says of them. What persuaded them to hunt out such an inhospitable region? It is hard to conceive. The very places which were least suitable for human occupation. Any gorge to which light of day never penetrated, or any rock hard upon the edge of a uh, precipice, surrounded on three sided on three sides by the eternal snow, was their preferred abode. This description shows that the, Caucas that the Caucasus Mountains is not the kind of place where people would desire to live. Okay? The, rec the recollection of ancient life along the hills and, and caves of, of West Asia is preserved in the oral traditions of the, of the region. Throughout these traditions, the white man's imprisonment in the caves is repeatedly alluded to. In their most common form, the ancient accounts tell of an evil ruler who having fought against the gods, was roped in with their iron chain and compelled to spend the rest of his life, days locked away inside of a cave. Again, these, account, these accounts chronicle the earlier history of the whites and tell of the circumstances that caused them to have lived there. You see that? In one sense, the Caucasian oral traditions can be looked at as a continuation of the earlier accounts dealing with the birth of, of the white-skinned child. See that? We call we recall his, that his arrival led to a calamity, and as a result, he was driven away and left in the hills of West Asia. One of the oral traditions from the Caucasus Mountains talks about a cruel king who kept robbing and murdering until he was driven away from the people and locked inside of a cave. It is also said that he shared his cave with a dog. Of that tradition, the side bay says, quote, but the king kept constantly attacking, pillaging, murdering, and robbing. So the Lord, so the Lord of the world took pity and seized the cruel king and incarcerated him in the depths of the rocks of Ararat. He was bound with the iron chain. His favorite dog alone shared his prison. You see that? Okay. Now, we're going to keep on going. Right? We're going to keep on going. And now we're going to get into the life inside the caves. Life inside the caves. 
Left without shelter, the Caucasians began to live in the innumerable caves which nature had carved in the limestone hills. Thousands of small cabin, cabins can still be found along the slopes of the Caucasus Mountains. Covering an area of several hundred miles, their openings face the north. Today, they are called the caverns of the North Caucasus. Caucasus. In his book, Cave Hunting, researchers on the evidence of caves respecting the early inhabitation of Europe, W.D. Boer Dawkins offers his perspective on the subject concerning the isolation and the circumstances which led to them, which led them to seek protection in the caves. Dawkins writes, quote, compelled by the, by the pressure of some great calamity to flee for refuge and to lead a half-savage life in these uh, inclement caves. They were cut off from the civilization to which they had been accustomed. A clear picture of the caves and their inhabitants is presented in the Holy Quran. In the chapter called al Kaf, the Quran states, And thou mightest see the sun, when it rose, decline from their cave to the right, and when it set, left behind them on the left, while they were in a wide space thereof, and thou mightest think them awake while they were asleep, while they were asleep, and when uh, and we turned them about to the right and to the left, with their dog outstretching his paws at the entrance. If thou didst look at them, thou wouldst be filled with awe because of them. In addition to the small caverns which nature had carved in the limestone slopes, the early Europeans also lived in man-made holes or hollows. The hollow, the hollow was a simple tunnel, 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 feet deep and wide enough for a man to crawl through. At the end of the tunnel was an underground nest or den. Like the natural cave, the hollow offered the white man a place of refuge and safety where he could hide, eat, and sleep. In times of bitter cold, the inhabitants of the hollow could cover the entrance with excrement or manure. This was a popular way of keeping warm during the winter months. So they're keeping warm with feces, with, him, with their feces. In addition to blocking out the cold air, the steam produced beneath the rotting excrement served to warm and humidify the inside of the hollow. Ancient sources indicate that keeping warm by staying beneath massive piles of stench was common throughout many parts of Europe and that the custom was still practiced as late as the time of Tacitus. Remember we just talked about Tacitus? Tacitus, the ancient historian, traveled extensively throughout the interior of Europe and wrote about some of the wild tribes who still inhabited that region in his day. In his book, Germania, Tacitus said of them, quote, They also have the habit of hollowing out underground caves, which they cover with masses of manure. Such, self, uh, such uh, shelters, shelters temper the kindness of the frost. You see that? In Book 4, Zephanon uh, and Bices mentions the underground tunnels having been used in the Caucasus Mountains. Zephan, uh, Zephanon goes on to say that the white inhabitants once shared those tunnels with goats, sheep, cattle, fowls, and their young, and that in those tunnels, quote, all the anim animals were reared and took their father, their, fa their father, or, or father, or folder. The suggestion is that in order to protect the animals from theft, it was necessary to keep them underground. You see that? Um, so it says that in prehistoric antiquities of the Aryan peoples, Dr. Ose uh, Squatter also discusses the ancient use of subterranean dwellings, i.e. Dwelling dug, dwellings dug in the earth, the existence of which is recorded amongst numerous Indo-Germanic Indo peoples and which afforded protection alike against the summer's heat and the winter's cold. So it is a fact that after they arrived in the hills of West Asia, 
the whites were compelled to seek refuge in the cages. I mean, in the caves. Concerning the way of life they had developed as a result of their isolation, Elijah Muhammad writes, They were punished by being deprived of divine guidance for 2,000 years, which brought them almost into the family of wild beasts, going upon all fours, eating raw, unteasing foods, living in caves and treetops, climbing and jumping from one tree to another. Is this an exaggeration, or is, or is it an accurate characterization of a historical event. Let's keep on going. The land of the uh, Mazarin. The, the, uh, the Mazarin. It says, uh, the most accessible parts of the Caucasus Mountains is that section known in ancient times as a uh, Mad uh, Mazarin. Maz the uh, Mazadarian, I'm sorry, the Mazadarian. Uh, located between the uh, Alvarez Mountains and the Caspian Sea. Uh, Maz uh, Mazadarian was during that cold, was during that day cold and wet and heavily wooded. So it says here that uh, an excellent source of these first ten accounts appear in a collection of writings called the, uh, the Pala. The Palava text. Uh, one of the ancient Palava texts relates that in the uh, Mazadaran, the white man had fallen so low in his living habits that he had started to resemble wild animals. This is sounding like what I did. This is sounding like the Yeti, the Yeti in Bigfoot. What I did in the caucus. What I did with the caucuses. Uh, the caucuses video. Chose people to caucus. It says that they they had fallen so low. In his living habits, that he once that he started to resemble wild animals, according to the uh, the uh, jam the jams namic behind the Caucasus Mountains in the land of Mazadaran, lived a race of cave dwellers whose members were considered by others to be non-human. The Palava document called the Dinkar describes them as filthy and living in holes. There, they are also reputed to have been practiced, to have practiced habits, habits so shameful that they were believed to be other than human beings until it was discovered that they spoke a form of language. Concerning the ancient discussion that was one, that was once that that once took place as to whether the people of Mazandaria were human and how it was finally decided that they were, the Dinkar states, quote. And they also said this about the vileness of the Mazadarans and the wretched state of the people in, of this region. Since their habits are thus, since they are filthy, that is dirt is theirs, possessing holes, that is holes are theirs, and having appellations. That is they call to one another. We men think and consider upon this that they are human beings. Okay, let's keep on going. Other ancient sources refer to the same people as devils or dev. So when we call them devils, it's not racist. This was what, what's written in history. In a commentary on the dev or devils, as they appear in ancient Zed, in the ancient Zed of Vista, M. N. Dahala explained that the devils of Mazadaran were simply the barbarians who later poured down in the great numbers and pillage the possessions of the Iranians. Let's keep on going. You see that? So, when we call them devils, it's not racist. This is, this is, what's, this is what history is saying. It goes on to say, in this same regard, the Shanama recalls a, recalls a time when the hills of the Mazadarian were inhabited by a race of what is called white devils. As to the real identity of the white devils of Mazadarian, A.G. Warner explains that the Shanama uses the term white demon, quote, white demon, as a, as a personification of the Mazadarians, rendered pale by the unhealthiness of their climate. B. Al, uh, B. Allen Donaldson also speaks of the dev, saying that they were a race of wild men who once who once ran away.
around, they ran around wearing the horns of animals. You see that? And the wild rule, Donaldson says of them, quote, the dev or the devils were merely wild men of the jungle of the Mazadarian who fought with wild animals. And when they killed these animals, they took the skins for clothing and wore them, head, horns, tails, and all. Donaldson's characterization of these earlier Caucasians as wild men who wore horns, that was wearing horns, does much to explain the many accounts of the horned men that are found throughout the records of the ancient world. Such accounts come to us mostly from the region of the Zargas Mountains, but sightings have been reported from as far away as India. The accounts all tell of a race of hairy, cannibalistic, horned men who lived in holes in the ground and ate their food raw. An example fitting this description is preserved in an oral account recorded by Varier, Varier Elwin in his book, Tribal Myths of, of Orissa. That account reads, quote, um, Far away to the west is a great mountain, too steep to climb. Here live the horned men. They are naked and their bodies are covered with long hair. If they meet a man who has no horns, they kill and eat him immediately. Their wives are very fat. They live in tiny houses built below ground level. They do not know how to cook, but they eat. But they do not know how to cook, but they eat their food raw. They eat. It, they eat their food raw. You see that? It says that all of these eyewitness accounts describe the whites of Mazadarian in such vivid, vivid terms only establishes that Elijah Muhammad's descriptions cannot be called an exaggeration. These accounts help to illustrate the depths to which the whites had fallen, had fallen following their expulsion from civilization. Lastly, the Shanama talks about a black warrior named Rustin who was said to have gone up into the hills of Mazadarian and to have waged war against the people of that area. According to the Shanama, Rustam was informed that in order for him to reach the caves of the white demon and his warrior chiefs, he would have to travel beyond the guards who patrol along the narrow passages leading up into the mountains. You see that? Are you hearing this? Give me one second. Let's keep on going. So, whites referred to as devils in ancient Egypt. The issue is whether the devil was originally used as a name for white people. In chapter 6, we saw how, Shana, how the Shanama, the Zed of Vesta, and other sources referred to the whites who have been compelled to live in the hills of West Asia as either devils, as either devils, Dev or demons. Countless other examples could be given, such as the writings of Zarathustra, who wrote extensively about what he perceived as the need to fight against the Caucasians invaders, who he too referred to as devils. Zarathustra Persia was a black man. It says, but some of the earliest evidence available to the students of history appear in the records of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians referred to the devils, referred to the devil as Satan under various names. The three most common of those names were Seth, Typhon, and Apophis. It is also a fact that throughout the writings of ancient Egypt, the Caucasian people are referred to as that as to uh, they are referred to as the Typhonians. Or the people of Seth. You remember you have Seth in the Bible? Seth? Seth? When Diodorus spoke of a group of foreigners who had been driven out of Egypt, he described them as he described them as men of color of Typhon. You see that? Um let's keep on going. Keep on going. Um, listen 
to this. Listen to this. The ancient Egyptians cut their goddamn heads off. Listen to this. Uh, the marks and characteristics that set apart the Typhonians of devils from the original people of Egypt were their hair and the pinkish and the pinkish or red color of their complexion. This much at least is admitted to the this much at least is admitted to by Wayne Ward, who talked about one Typhonian in particular whom he whom he calls Nictoka uh Nick Nictris. Nitocris, when he comments on her pale complexion, that the quote red men or ty Typhonians in Egypt were white people, Wayne White notes, and having a fair complexion, Nitocris was clearly one of the red Typhonians who were sacrificed by fire for the good of the people. The above quote shows two things. First, that the people known as the Typhonians had pale or ruddy complexions. And secondly, that those pale skinned people were from time to time rounded up and killed, quote, for the good of the people. What other what other evidence is there to support this claim? Throughout the history of ancient Egypt, many campaigns were waged against Caucasians, who as history shows repeatedly attacked Egypt. And, subject, and, uh, and subjected the original people to the most uh, reprehensible atrocities. Often, the people of Egypt found it necessary to fight back against the aggressors. Thus, many of the ancient texts speak of times when the original people would gather up all the white people, Typhonians, that they could find and either cut off their heads or burn them alive. So, it was with good reason that in Section 73 of the uh, of this Latin name or, or, or Rizai, Plutarch Plutarch acknowledged acknowledged the following quote For truly, as Manito has recorded, they used to burn living men to ashes, calling them Typhonians, and they used to scatter and dis and dispose of the, of the ashes by winnowing. Regarding this same matter, the Adorus wrote, apparently men who were similarly colored to Typhon were sacrificed by the kings. The rounding up and killings of the Caucasian by the kings of ancient Egypt, Egypt is exactly what Rainward was describing when he wrote, quote, though, though in the new kingdom at the festivals of the hoeing of the earth, the Seth sacrifices clearly had their heads cut off. It is equally clear that on other occasions the sacrifice had been by fire. And as much evidence from Egypt clearly shows that the term devil was once just another name for white people. And since that fact tends to substantiate what Elijah Muhammad has stated, then anyone objecting to Muhammad's use of that term on strictly historical grounds, historical grounds should be able to offer some kind of historical evidence capable of outweighing the above facts. If that evidence cannot be produced, then their, then their objection must be viewed as unreasonable. Musa, how were the Caucasians able to leave the caves and hills of West Asia and to begin their climb toward civilization? Elijah Muhammad teaches that a man named Musa was sent to lead the white race back into the light of civilization. So in 2000 BC, Musa traveled into the interior of Europe. There he began the, the tremendous task of introducing the Caucasian people to the laws of civilization. Concerning Musa's work among the savage tribes, Elijah Muhammad writes, quote, After 2,000 years of living as a savage, Allah raised up Moses, Musa to bring the white race again into civilization. It says to take their place as rulers. He brought them out of the caves, taught them to wear clothes, how to cook their food, how to season it with salt, what beef they should kill and eat. You see that? It goes in to say that. Um, a message to the black man. Elijah Muhammad informs that Musa and Moses went over to the whites from out of Egypt 
and that when he first found them, they were still living in caves. Other details from the life of Musa and his preliminary journey into the European wilderness are, out, are outlined in the book The Story of Mankind by Hendrik Bjelman Valoon. On page 17, Valoon talks about the man from Egypt who first led the whites out of, out of the caves and into the light of civilization. On page 17, Valoon writes, quote, these earliest, these earliest ancestors of ours who lived in, in the great European wilderness were rapidly learning many new things. It is safe to say that in the course of time, they would have given up the ways of savages and would have developed a civilization of their own. But suddenly there came an end to their isolation. They were discovered. Quote, a traveler from an from a unknown southland who had dared to cross the sea and the, high, and the high mountain passes had found his way to the wild people of the European continent. He came from Africa. His home was in Egypt. So, Valoon credits Musa with having traveled from Egypt up into, the, up into the European wilderness and with leading the white man out of his savage condition. Listen to this. The ancient writer Diodorus agrees that Musa was an Egyptian. In one place, Diodorus even calls him an Egyptian priest. According to the ancient writer, Musa had set out on a journey to the north, where he established a, col a colony of, where he established a colony among a people, whom Diodorus calls a race of a race of lepers. There, he tells us Musa taught them how to follow direction and prepare them to, and prepare them to make ready for war. Still, more facts related to the life of Musa can be found in the writings of the ancient Egyptians. Such writings tell of a man known, known as Osar Seth. Osar Seth, who had left his home, where he had lived in the city of Heliopolis. They say that he changed his name to Musa or Moses and went off to teach the Caucasians. The same record points out that after he had given them a code of laws, they came down out of the hills and launched, and launched an attack against Egypt. For that reason, Manito's account of the white man's invasion of Egypt is particularly significant. After discussing the brutality that the white invaders showed toward the original people of Egypt, Manito turns his attention to the way in which they had first been led into the knowledge of civilization. Concerning their attack on Egypt, and the civilization who had taught them, Manito writes, quote, Not only did they set cities and villages on fire, not only did, did they pillage the temple with, and mutilate the images, but, but not content with that, they habitually used the very sanctuaries as kitchens for roasting the venerated sacred animals and forced the priests and prophets to slaughter them and cut their throats. And then turned them and then turned them out naked. It is said that the priest who gave them a constitution and a law of codes and a code of laws was a native of Heliopolis named Osiris. After the after the Heliopolian god Osiris, and that when he went over to this people, he changed his name was called Moses. It says here that that Manito's records. That Manito records the whites as having invaded Egypt after it had been taught by Musa is perfectly consistent with the words of Elijah Muhammad on page 104. Message to the black man, he he writes, quote, They rose up from the caves, they rose up from the caves and hillsides of Europe, went back to Asia, and have ruled nine tenths of that great continent. Conclusion. Throughout this book, we have presented evidence which speaks to the accuracy of, of the teaching of Elijah Muhammad. We have tried to show that the teaching of Muhammad concerning the origins and the earlier history of the white race are consistent with the facts and with the writings of ancient the traditional accounts. Now I've just read this whole book from front to back for free within a matter of a day. And I didn't charge you not a damn cent. So now you got so now you know where the white man comes from. Now you know why they are called devils. You don't have to guess and speculate. Now you know who the, who is God. You know who God is, who the who is the damn devil. It ain't no damn spook. 
These are flesh and blood beings. Okay? This, this is what this is. So, this is, this is the conclusion of making of the white man, history, tradition, and the teaching of Elijah Muhammad, Paul Lawrence Guthrie. You can get this on Amazon, use. I'm about to reread it again. So we know, so now we know for a fact that in the Bible, Adam is representing, Adam and Eve are representing the white race. Chapter 4, let's read it again. Chapter 4, Adam and Eve represents a group of people. What group of people is Adam and Eve representing? Many Hebrew scholars have insisted that the name Adam, this is also in the, in the Sumerian clay tablet, in the Sumerians, taught to them white men. Many of the Hebrew scholars have insisted that the name Adam or Adam is a plural noun. They mean this by they mean by this that it represents a group and not a singular in a singular individual. Moreover, that Adam is intended to represent a group of men and women is made clear by the way in which the name is used throughout the Old Testament. Among several examples are those that appear in Genesis 127 and Genesis 5:2. Both of which they, male and female, created he them and called their name Adam. Um, here, the Bible says that Adam is a group of men and women. If Adam were a single individual, then the Bible would not refer to him as them. Certainly, a group is a group is being spoken of, but which group of men and women is Adam presumed to represent? Also, who made Adam? And what does the name Adam really mean? Adam was made by a group of people. People. The book of Genesis first speaks of the making of Adam in the 26th verse of the first chapter. There, the words of the Old Testament describes Adam as a group of people who are, who are about to be made by another group of people. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In this case, the Bible not only calls Adam them, but it also refers to the makers of Adam as us. This shows that Adam and the makers of Adam were in fact two separate groups of people. The English word God, as it appears in this verse, is a translation from the Hebrew word Elohim. Like Adam, Elohim is also a plural noun. It indicates a group of beings, and it too is both masculine and feminine. So, these, so the Elohim are black people, black men and women. It goes on to say, It goes on to say, G.D. Puckerer, chairman of the Theosophical Society, lectured on the significance of the word Elohim in a book called Fundamentals of Esoteric Philosophy concerning the actual meaning of the word and how it refers to a plurality of beings. Plural is more, more than one. D. Puckerish pointed out, quote, the first part of it alone is El, meaning God, divinity, from which comes the second, a feminine from form, Elohim, goddess, is merely the masculine plural. So we tr if we translate every element in this single word, it would mean God and goddess. That the God and goddesses whom the, whom the Bible credits with having, with having made Adam were only a group of men and women can be plainly demonstrated 
by examining the way in which Elohim is used in other places throughout the Bible. A server of the facts reveals that Elohim is not actually a name, but is instead only a title. You see that? So, lastly, R.A. Thylinson, professor of systematic theology, wrote an article in which he plainly showed that the word Elohim derives from a root indicating strength or might. And with this connotation, he, write, he wrote, it is applied in the Old Testament to men. Based on all these facts, it is evident that the Elohim were only a group of people. People. Adam means white men. What is the real meaning of the other of the name Adam? Many believe that Adam just means man or mankind. But the usual words for man in the Semitic languages generally are not cognate with the name Adam. Instead, the facts show that the name springs from the Hebrew root DM, meaning reddish in color, concerning which James Hastings, writing in his Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, adds, the name having originated in a ruddy race. By the word ruddy is meant what the dictionary says of it, pink color or reddish. So let's go here before I'm out of time. To the word melanin or feel. You got mel. So you got melanin, right? You got melanin. This is what your Bible is talking about. So you got melanin. Black, dark. It's a broad term for a group of natural pigments found in most, most, most organisms. So it says here that there are three basic types of melanin. Eumelanin, pheomelanin, and neuromelanin. See that? The most common type is eumelanin, of which there are two types, brown eumelanin and dark eumelanin. Pheomelanin is a cystin derivative that, decaying, that, that contains uh, polybenzatine portions that are largely responsible for the color of red hair among other pigmentations. You see that? So, you have here pheomelanin or pheomelanin. The same thing that the, 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 that the gorilla snowflake has. What does it say? S snowflake had unpigmented skin and hair. Snowflake had poor vision, which is which is associated with albinism. Quote, the eye and snowflake, this gorilla, had a bluish, had a bluish. You see that? Bluish, blue. And a light blue iris lens. So now we're going to click on pheomelanin. Pheomelanin or pheomelanins impart a pink to red hue depending on concentrations. Pheomelanins are particularly concentrated in the lips, nipple glands, or penis, and vagina. When a small amount of brown eumelanin in hair, which would otherwise cause, brown, uh, cause blonde hair, is mixed with red pheomelanin, the result is orange hair, which is typically called red hair. Pheomelanin is also present in the skin, and redheads consequently have, and redheads consequently often have a more pinkish hue to their skin as well. So, let's go back here. Adam, the white man, he's in your Bible. The white man and woman. By the word ready, it means pink color, pinkish color, or reddish. Right? 
Descriptions of the white man as red or pink color appear all over the world. Okay? Even the Bantu people in the myth description, in the myth describe Adam as red. Okay? So, it says that the Hebrew and English lexicon also admits that Adam names revealed the paleness of his complexion. In an article discussing the ruddy characteristics of Adam's skin, Dr. William Justinius writes, quote, The Arab distinguishes two races of men, one red, ruddy, which we call white, the other black. So, it says that Adam is a white, he's a white, ruddy, pale-skinned, red man. This is what this is saying. So, it says that the Elohim, in the beginning, God, the gods, black men and women, created the heavens and the earth. Right? So it says here that, it says here that, there the words of the Old Testament describe Adam as a group of people who are about to be made by another group of people. Okay? So who is this group of people that Adam was made by? Black people. So now we're going into red hair. Red hair. Who has red hair? Here's your Adam and Eve. Right here in the goddamn Bible. This is them. Woman with red hair. Red or ginger hair occurs nastily in 1 to 2% of other human population. Okay? You have, it's, it says here that, among people of northern or northwestern European ancestry and lesser frequency and other populations, it is most common in individuals for a recessive chromosome, MCR1 protein. Red hair varies in hue. From a deep burgundy or bright copper or auburn to bright to burnt orange or red orange. Characterized by heavy, by high levels of red or reddish pigment, field melanin, and relatively low levels of dark pigment U melanin is associated with fair skin color, lighter eye color. Right? Same thing with the goddamn gorilla. Freckles. And sensitivity to ultraviolet light. Let's go to the goddamn. Let's see. I got enough time here. And yes, I got. Let's hurry up. So and blade. When Blade was talking to Frost, he said, your mascara's, your, your mascara's running. He put on sunblock. Because because Frost and Blade was representing the white race, the vampires. The white man. The devil. And Blade is representing God. Because he's the daywalker. Blade. And... Frost talking. Here's the scene right here. like 
your mascara is running. Looks like your mascara is running. The sun is starting. The sun is starting to burn the ass up. So let's look at this split right quick. Um, what's it called? Um, uh, UV. UV camel sunscreen. So you got UV, UV camel sunscreen. Look at this. How the sun sees you. Check this out. Don't you see this? This is what you look like. This is his Adam. This is what you look like in ultraviolet light. An ultraviolet camera can show non yet visible changes in your skin. This is how white people look. Freckles, look, freckles, freckles. What this thing just say? Red hairs. Red hair, low levels, pigment, lighter eye color, freckles, sensitive to ultraviolet light. Now watch what he put. Now, now look. This is in the sun, but we can't see it because our eyes is not picking up on it. But look at this. Now watch what happens when they put on sunblock. The white man. Look at the, look at the black girl. You don't see that shit. The sun's not burning her. Now watch what they put on sunscreen. What did it look like? So, so what does this sunscreen look like? Look at this. This is what happens. When you white people go on the beach, when you put this sunblock on, you can't see this. Because your eyes are not picking up on it. But when you pick up, when you put that sunblock on and you outside in the sun tanning, and you put that sunblock on, this is what you're this is what you reverting back to. This black. Black. This what this is this is this is facts. This is what you're changing back into. But you can't. Look, she's shocked. Like what the fuck was that? She's like, what? Look. She put that shit on her face. She's like, what? I'm black. Oh, shit. Black people don't need to put it on. Facts for your ass. This is something. This is this is real, thorough scholarship. This is scholarship. I'm I'm giving you free scholarship. You heard what Blade told Vamp told Frost and Blade. He said your mascara's running. Blade put on Frost put on sunblock. So once again, in your Bible and other religious texts and throughout the world, throughout history. Who is God? Who is what we have been trained to call God? You've been looking at God the whole time. You black men and women, when you look in the mirror, you're looking at God. With that being said, peace.